Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's been a couple of months since OSIRIS-REx returned its bounty of asteroid sample material to Earth, and the scientists started to get to work on analysing this material, except that they've run into a little bit of a problem. Apparently, a couple of the fasteners used to hold the sample canister together are refusing to release themselves, and they don't want to work at them too hard because they might, you know, shave off pieces of metal which would contaminate the sample. But that problem is nothing compared to the problems that the very first mission to recover material from an asteroid went through, the Hayabusa spacecraft back in 2003. Originally conceived off in the 1990s, it was called Muses C, but by 2003 it was ready to go and it had been renamed Hayabusa with a with second spacecraft attached called Minerva. This would be a tiny 600 gram Rover, it was more like a hopper because, of course, the gravity on the target asteroid was very low. The target was an asteroid known as 1998 SF-36, which was then renamed Itokawa in honour of Hideo into Itokawa, who was one of the sort of pioneers founding figures of Japanese rocketry. It was a 500 kilogram spacecraft launched on board a Mu-5 rocket. That's one of Japan's signature rocket designs, which doesn't stand vertically on the pad. It starts out with an angle, so it's ready to go into its gravity turn. It launched in May 2023. It was expected to reach its target in 2005 and then return to the Earth with its sample in 2007. The spacecraft was propelled by four ion thrusters using xenon propellant, which allowed the spacecraft to accelerate slowly towards its uh, target. Unfortunately, soon after uh, departing Earth, one of the thrusters failed, reducing them to three. However, in late October 2003, the Halloween storm kicked in on the sun. This was the largest recorded storm in modern times. Of the top 10 most powerful solar flares, four of them happened between late October, early November 2003. The most powerful solar flare at the time was thought to be X-25 class, but that was only because the instruments were completely saturated and later analysis showed that it was an X-45, making it more than twice as powerful as the next most powerful solar flare ever recorded. As a result of this, the solar panels on the spacecraft were damaged, reducing the electrical power available and, by extension, the amount of power available to run the propulsion system. And that meant that they had to redesign the mission. They wouldn't get to asteroid Itakawa as early as they'd like. But by September 2005, they were closing in on the asteroid and successfully rendezvoused with the object and began taking images, getting the first close look at Itakawa. The scientists would describe the broad shape of the asteroid as like a sea otter in space. It's believed that it's actually made of two bodies that at some point have come together and coalesced into a single object. The spacecraft was able to take hundreds of high-resolution pictures and use its infrared spectrometer and X-ray spectrometer to you know, really analyse the object. But a few weeks after arriving, two of the three reaction wheels which are used for attitude control had failed. Still, they felt they could control the spacecraft well enough to attempt landings and, of course, dropping the Minerva probe onto the surface. Uh, so the way this would work is the spacecraft would approach the asteroid, release the Minerva, and then the spacecraft itself would back away, leaving Minerva to descend to the surface, where it could then hop around on the asteroid doing science. Unfortunately, there was a problem. During this process, they had to switch the signal from one antenna to another, and somewhere along the lines, information was lost. They transmitted the signal to release the Minerva spacecraft, but in the time it took to reach the target, the spacecraft's autonomous systems had actually taken over and had arrested the approach to the asteroid, and the spacecraft was in fact going away from the asteroid when Minerva was released. So Minerva operated flawlessly for the next 20 hours or so as it floated through deep space on its own. But a couple of weeks later, they were ready to go again. This time, they wanted to get a sample from the surface, and the place they picked was a feature named the Muses Sea. It was like a dust pond, I believe. And the way this would work is the spacecraft would go down, and on the way down, it would release a small 
a softball sized probe called uh, it was a like a target marker which would land on the surface it would be emitting a flashing strobe light that would use for navigation they also had a series of metal sheets in this inside this which had the names of hundreds of thousands of people that had submitted their name to be landed on an asteroid now it didn't quite go according to plan again autonomous systems took over and did some maneuvers that weren't anticipated but the spacecraft did actually touch down with its sample horn on the surface and sitting at an angle and so they commanded the spacecraft to head back into orbit around itokawa and they tried again a week later. Now, the way the sampling system works is that there's basically a big tube, and down the middle of that, they shoot uh, little bullets, which will hit the surface and create a spray of material, which will hopefully run up inside the tube into the sampling canister. The bullets are made of tantalum, which is something that is sufficiently rare that it is unlikely to get confused with the composition of the asteroid itself. So the spacecraft was supposed to have done this, but later data indicated that probably didn't happen. And they found this out before they left the asteroid. But immediately after the sampling event, there were bigger problems. Something in the way it had hit the asteroid had damaged part of the attitude control system. And it was probably leaking propellant, which was causing the spacecraft to spin out of control. They began to lose solar orientation, they lost uh, contact, the tracking went away, and then on December 8th, they lost contact with the spacecraft as the spin became a tumble and the orientation was lost with the Earth. So that could have been the end of the mission, but uh, about six weeks later, on 23rd of January, they managed to get in contact with the spacecraft. The situation was not great, but the engineers were able to revive systems and attempt to bring the spacecraft back under control. Unfortunately, the thruster-based attitude control system is no longer available, presumably because the thing that was causing the spin-up was due to fuel or propellant leaking from the spacecraft, and there's no fuel left to run the thruster. So they are in trouble because they don't have reaction wheels, they don't have any chemical thrusters. Instead, they resorted to the ion thrusters, but they didn't use the ion thrusters to actually generate you know, the thrust they needed. Part of the ion thruster is a neutralizer port, which is supposed to spray out uh, ions that will neutralize the exhaust. But they figured out that they could uh, discharge xenon through this, and because of the orientation of the four the ports on the four different thrusters, they could actually use this for attitude control by using the xenon as a cold gas thruster. So they had regained control of the spacecraft using a, a hack. Now, during of course the landing, they looked at the telemetry and the data. They realized that the sampling system had not fired correctly, and that was a problem because they couldn't guarantee there would be any material in the sample recovery system. But without propulsion, there really wasn't any easy method for them to attempt another sampling. So a year passes and in January of 2007, they finally close the lid of the sample canister, hoping that some sort of dust has made it in there from the asteroid. And uh, they then begin to use the ion thrusters to return to Earth. They, they departed the asteroid in April of 2007 with only two engines operating. And then by February of 2009, only one of the ion engines was operating. And finally, in November, that engine failed too. They did not have any good working ion engines at that point, And they were worried they would never make it back to Earth. But the engineers realized that the things that had failed on each engine were slightly different. And one engine had a perfectly good ion source and another engine had a perfectly good neutralizer. So if they operated together, they could still operate as a single ion thruster and get propulsion and that would get them home. And by March of 2010, Hayabusa was on course for Earth. On the 13th of June 2010, the spacecraft released the sample return canister and it followed the sample return canister into the atmosphere, burning up. We have some amazing footage showing this. The canister was returned to the Earth, it landed in Australia, and scientists took a good hard look at the interior. 
Again, they didn't expect to find anything, but they combed over the material, the contents, the internals. They had little electrostatic tweezers that they could use to manipulate and pick up things, and they found some grains, tiny microscopic grains. In total, they collected about 1,500 samples from the asteroid, most being smaller than 10 micrometers. That is one hundredth of a millimeter in diameter. But that was big enough to do science on. In fact, with a single 10 micrometer grain, they can cut that into several pieces and send it to different instruments. They can do mass spectroscopy to look at the distribution of elements and specifically the noble gases, which are very useful for looking at uh, cosmic ray interactions. They can you know, look at the core of it using electron microscopes and scanning tunneling microscopes. And uh, they can also do molecular spectroscopy, looking at the larger molecular materials, the organic molecules, which make up this object. Detailed examination of a number of grains showed that the surface had been weathered, that uh, high energy particles coming in had changed the oxidation state of the iron, making them red. And this was really critical to understanding asteroids, because an S-type asteroid is the most common type of asteroid in the solar system because of its silicate spectrum. And this was notably different from the most common type of meteorite that recovered, the chondrites. There were many scientists who thought that S-type asteroids were actually stony asteroids that had come from the interior of a larger body that had been allowed it to be processed into more conventional minerals. But this showed that actually the chondrites and the S-type asteroids are the same thing, that the asteroids have just been weathered from their time in space. Cosmochemists used a mass spectrometer to look at the ratios of noble gases and their isotopes, helium, neon, and argon, because these elements are produced by high-energy cosmic rays hitting into the surface and having performing nuclear reactions. And by looking at the ratios, you're able to determine how long a particle has been exposed to space. And the number they came up with was 3 million years. Now, if they... Uh, if the particle had been maybe about half a meter under the surface, that could lengthen to about 8 million years. But this is a very short length of time. It means that the surface is very new and is therefore being continuously replaced. Is the asteroid evaporating? If so, it would imply an evaporation rate, which would lead to the loss of Itokawa within a, a billion years or so, which is relatively short on the time scale of the solar system. Later, two teams would find that the grains did have water in them, and that this water came from solar wind particles impacting the surface and reacting with oxygen. Now, if this water content was extrapolated to the entire object, then the total water content per unit mass would be similar to that of the Earth, and that lends credence to the notion that asteroids brought water to the Earth in the early formation of the solar system. Now, while all this research was happening in labs on the ground, another spacecraft from Japan was wending its way to the asteroid Ryugu. It had another set of uh, instruments, some new tricks, including a device best described as a space anti-tank weapon, which was designed to blow a hole in the asteroid and expose layers underneath the surface so it could be sampled. The sequel managed to avoid many of the technical problems of the original one, but that is another story. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.